Welcome to another exciting edition of Inside Monster Jam. I'm Scott Jordan, and today we discuss the return to international competition. I am joined in studio by Mike Moser, the newly promoted director of international operations. Mike, thanks for coming on, buddy. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Scott. And we are joined from Texas Truck Works by the charismatic Colt Stevens. Colt, it is wonderful to see you again. Thanks for coming on Inside Monster Jam. Of course, man. Glad to be back. Anytime I get to hear your voice is great. I know you're lying. And let's start right there because I have a bone to pick with you, my friend. You have just been elusive from me. You've been avoiding me. You haven't returned my texts, my calls. Up until yesterday, I hadn't heard from you since we left Orlando in May. And I, I know that it's because you wanted to you know, avoid me telling me that you're not coming back in the broadcast booth next year. And I appreciate that. But when I found out, it took three hours for me to compose myself and walk out of this building. You know, it was hard for me. I didn't want to let you know. You know, we such good friends for the last two years inside the booth. I was like, man, I really just can't break it to Scott yet. I wasn't ready, so I've been kind of ducked me a little bit, but you asked me to come on here to sit here in the booth with you this way, so I'm excited for it. I'm um, glad to be back. Uh, and I won't duck your calls as much anymore. Like, I'll, <laughs> I'll just screen a couple of them. I appreciate it. Thank you. And and Moser, congratulations on your promotion. I'll talk a little bit about your new role as Director of International Operations. Thank you, first of all. Um, but I basically oversee all the operations that happen outside of the U.S. Um, so whether it's our show in London, whether it's the upcoming shows in Australia, I manage them from the top down, from the budgeting to the actual execution of the shows and then getting onto the shows after that. So how long have you been a part of the international operations for Monster Jam? Uh, my first international event was 2016 in Osaka, Japan. Um, and then I took over doing full-time international in 2018. Um, and then again, now after COVID, uh, started with London. All right. So, Colt, you, you've been a little quiet on social media. I see you sharing some things. Um, you know, you've got big plans for the rest of this year. So I want to give you a platform to tell the fans a little bit about what you're going to be up to here as we close out 2022. You know, I've been super excited to tell everybody I'm actually going to make my debut back driving in Australia this year internationally. It's so awesome, which is great because I actually started my career in Australia. In 2014, the very first show I ever did for Monster Jam was in Melbourne, and I kind of get to repeat that. Two years off, not driving, being in the booth with you, get to go back to Australia, driving the truck over there. But the kicker is, man, it's not like I'm in any truck. Max D. I am pumped to be in that truck. Been talking to Tom a little bit about it. I was a little nervous, to be honest with you. I haven't had much seat time compared to a lot of the other drivers, but Tom has instilled a lot of confidence in me. He wants me to go drive that truck, drive the wheels off of it each and every event. And trial by fire, buddy, we're coming in hot. I'm super excited to be back behind the wheel, in the seat, especially in the iconic Max D truck. Well, I'm super happy for you, you know, spend, spending so much time in the booth with you. You know, I, I, I always understood how much you wanted to drive. It's in your blood. It's what you, you were put on this earth to do. So I'm happy for you. Uh, selfishly, I am still sad to not have you next to me, but I'm looking forward to Let's talk about your, your driving career. Uh, your last event driving was February 29th um, in what 2020 or 2019, actually, uh, February 29th of 2019 in Jacksonville. I was there. You tied for third in Bro Dozer. So Two years and seven months since you've competed at an event. So what? Uh, let's talk first about how you're feeling about getting back in the truck. And second, let's talk about any rust that you might have to kick off when you go to Australia. You know, I'm excited to get back in the truck. I'm mean, super pumped. Like you said, uh, you know, this is really my passion. I love talking about my I love being in the booth with you. But being behind that wheel is, I feel like what I was born. You know, my dad being a driver for 20-something years. Being in the beginning of what Monster Jam was and building trucks, you know, that's just part of my life. You know, I think of those things as living, breathing things, and I cannot wait to get behind the wheel again. So I'm excited about that. You know, I did get the opportunity to go to Monster Jam University by UNOH this summer one time at uh, Tom's house. Did a little bit of driving, knocking some rust off. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit more rusty than I thought. We always talk about in the booth drivers having muscle memory. And that's one of the things I have to get back. I have to remember or let my body remember how to do it without me actually thinking about it. And that's some things that it comes with time. I can make myself do it, but it's that delay of thinking about me and that move, it's costing me a little bit. So I've been watching a lot of videos, old stuff that we've been doing. And the, the stuff that everybody's been doing here lately, Monster Jam is always evolving. And we're always getting better and stronger. The competition is getting stronger. And I've had two years and seven months off while they've all been getting a lot stronger in their driving capabilities. So I was a little nervous. I'm coming out with a bit. 
I'm not holding back whatsoever. You know, 12 by prior, like I said earlier, I'm going in, we're going to figure it out. I'm going to make my body, I'm going to make my body work. I'm going to beat that truck every weekend and every show that I can and go out there and put a show on for the fans. When you went to MJU, was it a humbling experience for you? Uh, were you there by yourself? Were there other drivers there uh, learning? Or was it just you and Tom kind of one-on-one? You know, I got to tell you, I was actually there with uh, Pat Glorillo, the youngest brother of Pat Glorillo's, and I was excited to see him come up. I know he had a little bit of seat time coming in before moving the trucks around uh, through the previous years while they were at shows. But I got to tell you, he came out with a bang, and I was like, woo, this is the young guys coming up. He's, he's moving pretty quick. He's learning quickly. So I definitely have some big shoes to fill going with Max D. Uh, definitely, it was cool opportunity, too, for me to see a, a veteran driver. I do know some things that I've learned in the trucks. It just comes naturally to me. Watching him hit those same walls or those uh, competitions, he figure it out. He kind of almost mimicked things that I was doing. And I was learning from him as well. So, you know, there was a lot going on there. We were not really on a stadium track, if I haven't been in an arena in many years. You know, it's been a long time since I've done an arena. I think Zombie would have been the last one I did one, uh, 2017 or 18, something like that. So when I was actually up there on an arena track trying to move and trying to remember the rear steer and the front steering and all the moving parts on the truck took me a little bit. So uh, it was definitely humbling. I came out you know, wide open, good to go, God was good, but then a little bit of you know, diversity, was able to overcome it. And I finished the week off strong, I felt good. So if I can continue that momentum into Australia, we're going to be a force to be reckoned with. I, I think with with the pandemic, you know, basically uh, shutting down international travel, a lot of our fans forget what a, a powerful international presence we had in Monster Jam. You go back to 2019. Now we were in in South Africa, the Manchester, UK, Johannesburg, Cardiff, Wales, Coventry, Gothenburg, Antwerp, Melbourne, Tokyo, San Juan, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and then the final event was Sao Paulo, Brazil on December 21st of 2019. So, I mean, that was a, a gigantic tour and you were around for that. So talk a little bit about that schedule and doing all of those international events what our presence was overseas at the time. Oh, it's great. 19 was our busiest year yet for the international tour. I stayed busy all year, as you just mentioned, with all those events. Like, the frequent fire miles are crazy <laughs> to, for, to start off with. But it takes a lot of planning. You mentioned all those cities. Think about all those time zones, how, how the communication is with our partners in each market. Australia, 14 hours ahead of here. And Singapore's 10 hours ahead. So there, there's all kinds of different time zones. And that's one of the most challenging aspects to advancing those events, getting them set up so that we can put on the best event possible for the Monster Jam fans in each and every city. They, they, can't, they won't experience the time zone differences. They expect a Monster Jam event. So we have to work around everything to make sure they get the, the top level event they deserve. Well, what is the time frame like for these international events? I know with the domestic events, you know, we go from one city to another and the crew just starts, you know, getting the track set up, getting the dirt in. Uh, but international, sometimes you, you know, you have to fly those crazy miles and go a little further. So what is that schedule like for our crews when we do international events to get the track ready, to get the, the, the trucks ready, get the drivers ready so that when everybody shows up, it's ready to rock? It, things start months in advance. Uh, the Australia trucks shipped in July for these upcoming events in October. That shows you how far we have to be planned ahead of time. So all the supplies, all the trucks left here at headquarters in Florida in July, they just arrived in port in Melbourne last week. So we're talking months ahead, we have to have everything planned out and those trucks show up, show ready. Each truck's in its own shipping container and it, we, we pull them out, put the big tires on, and we're ready to go for the event. The actual week of, once we're there, is very similar to what we do here in the States as far as setup time. Generally, a, a Tuesday or Wednesday move into a Saturday event. Um, very similar to what you would experience here. It's all the lead time is, is getting everything there. Well, how do you ship the trucks over to another continent, much less not a country, another continent? How do they go? So they're in a 40-foot shipping container. There's one truck per container, which is different. In the States, there's two trucks in a 53-foot trailer. Here, it's one truck per container, and they actually go on boats, on cargo ships, which is what takes so long. It's, you know, eight weeks on a boat right. to get to Australia from here versus, you know, it could be 10, 12 hours up the highway here in the U.S. Wow. Oh, that's crazy. Colt, now let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your career international. You've done some of these international events before. So from a driver's standpoint, what is that schedule like for you? I know Moser said, you know, there's some jet lag there with the time zones. But for you specifically as a driver, what does it look like when you take off on an airplane to go to another country to do a Monster Jam event? You know, it's kind of cool, actually, being a driver overseas. You know, you don't have that communication with your family sometimes. 
because like he said, it's 14 hours difference. They might be sleeping during the day when the show's going on. But I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's actually kind of nice because it's clears your head before the show. You know, you, you're like, I gotta go to the show, I gotta do the event, I'm gonna do good there, and then I can call my family later and talk about how I did. So there's not so many nerves. It's kind of relaxing to be honest with you. At the same time, a lot of these fans have never seen a Monster Jam event before. This is gonna be their first time to see it live. And so you want to do the best you absolutely can. You need to go out there and put on a show. And I got to tell you, we go to some of these uh, soccer uh, stadiums and things like that. And we fill them up. And the fans are crazy. I've been to these events where they are so loud. They don't leave the venue. They just sit there and clap for you. And, hear, and that's all. It puts me in awe to see that. And all the fans enjoy it so much to see 1500 horsepower right in their face. All those cake tires. You know, it's so awesome to see those fans experience it for the first time. So it puts a little bit of pressure on you in that sense. So you remove a little bit of pressure on your family side because of the no communication, but you gain a little bit on the fan side. It's great to see the culture, experience all the things that are different around the world. I mean, who doesn't like traveling the world? And then I get to do it in a monster jam truck. It doesn't get any better than that. So no events internationally in 2020, no events in 2021. Then we come back June 18th and 22, London Stadium. London, downtown, beautiful city, a lot of rabid sports fans out there. Uh, before we get to the actual event, let's talk about the preparation. When did it become an option for Monster Jam to head back overseas? Well, to start with London, we actually were going to go to London in 2020 prior to COVID. So this is kind of a continuation of what we had already had planned. So once we got the clearance on the COVID side, I'd say about March of this year, everything started falling into place for that London engagement in June. So really, we only had about... A, three month time period to get everything lined up. And then with the shipping times we talked about, that really shortens everything up to get the trucks ready. It was really the fleet guys out there in the shop really did a great job getting those trucks put together in time to be able to get on a boat and then go to London with a, a show three months out. So I, I watched it on, on the live stream and the place looked like it was just rocking like crazy. Talk a little bit about the atmosphere and you know, did it, did it fulfill your expectations, you know, exceed your expectations? How did you feel about the crowd that was there and the event that took place? The crowd was great. And we experienced that a lot, especially London was a first time market for us. We've been all over the world, but this is the first time we got to do an event in the city of London. So huge milestone for us, for Monster Jam, for Feld Entertainment to have an event there, but then to have all those fans come out and show us the support in year one in a place we've never been. They've seen it on TV, but to Colt's point, when they actually see 1,500 horsepower performing in front of them, and they feel the engines, they, they feel the excitement. Uh, you can't overstate that, and how the electricity within that venue was incredible. Right, Cole, you mentioned you're going into Max D, so uh, you, you said you had a lot of pride there that Tom has faith in you to drive that truck the way that he expects you to drive it over in Australia. But uh, who are you looking forward to competing against the most or with the most? Or, you know, are you just looking forward to kind of focusing on yourself? But I know, you know, you since you haven't driven in a long time, you have to have your eyes on somebody that might, you know, set you up for victory there. All of them. I got my eye on all of them right now. You know, everybody has been working really hard. Uh, there's a lot of great drivers out there. And I honestly don't know where I'm at right now. I'm pretty confident in my ability. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not really thinking about the drivers. I'm thinking about beating the truck. I'm thinking about beating myself and beating the track. If I can beat those three things, I'm going to win. And that's what I want to go over there and do. I'm in Max D. I didn't go over there to get second place. So I don't care who's in the other, other lane, who's there with me. I'm going to beat them. I'm going to do the best I can to do that. And, you know, all these other drivers have been so great. I cannot just pick out one. I want to beat all of them. And I'm worried about all of them equally the same. So I'm going to beat myself. I'm going to beat the track. I'm going to, I'm going to make everything work perfectly, hit my marks. And if I can do that, we're going to come away with a win. Uh, you made a, a seamless transition from the driver's seat into the broadcast booth. Now you have the opportunity to to do the same thing going from the broadcast booth back into the driver's seat. Is there anything that you feel you have learned over the last two years calling the action that you can take with you as a driver that maybe you didn't know before? Oh, there is so much I learned in that booth up there with you, Scott. We're able to look down on the track and get a different view than we do from the stands. You know, usually we're in the driver's section watching and you can't see the entire track. So I had the opportunity to see things that I really never really saw on TV or didn't see while I was sitting in the stands. For example, the way Tom goes to the corners in the Chicago style. 
not using rear steer at all. I probably wouldn't have noticed that in the stands very quickly like I did in the booth. You know, the way people are hitting jumps, the way they're keeping their momentum going, the way they're adjusting to the tracks, holes on the tracks, stuff like that that I was able to see in the booth and the way that the drivers are driving the monster jam trucks. I'm going to be able to translate that into the truck a lot because I actually saw it and I can, I can build off of that, try and adjust my driving style to be what the new generation or the new drivers are kind of changing. And it's crazy to say that. It's only been two years. But that's just how fast Monster Jam is evolving and how fast we're able to do these new crazy wild moments, bicycles, stoppies, moonwalks. I mean, honestly, that's some of the hardest stuff. I'm excited for freestyle. I'm excited for racing. But I'm kind of a little nervous about the skill stuff. So being able to see that in the booth and, and trying to adjust is going to be great. And I think it's going to be an advantage in the long run for sure. Well, let's talk about the skills competition, you know, because we, we've been able to see it evolve a little bit here domestically. Um, do you have your, you know, your, your preparations already going as far as what you're going to do? Because I know, I feel like when, when your name was announced as competing international, a lot of eyeballs went to it because it's your first time back in the truck. So a lot of expectations out there, I'm sure that you put on yourself, but other fans that have put on you as well. So w what are your insights on that competition? What are you planning to do? That, like I said earlier, it's probably the, the competition I'm most uh, nervous about. Purely think about this as well. Not only has it been two years since I drove, but when I was driving the two years prior, prior to that, I was in a diesel truck. I had a turbocharger. I wasn't able to do some of those moves in that diesel truck because of the turbo lag. So I had kind of even further behind the eight ball because of that diesel truck. But one thing it made me really good at is the bicycle slap wheelies stuff like that so going into this this going back into an alcohol truck in max D, my goal for skills is to be well-rounded i want to be able to do anything because i've said it before in the booth with you the thing about skills is doing something different once somebody does a moonwalk that's a no that's the most points you're going to get for that unless you just absolutely go out there and do an all, all something that's just absolutely awesome so if somebody does the moonwalk, I want to be able to go out there and either do it better, but if I can't, I have a bag of tricks up my sleeve that I can go out there and do to separate myself and try and get more points. So I want to be well-rounded. Maybe not the best at everything or best at one thing, but good at all of them. And if I can do that and be consistent, it's the thing. It's the end of the day, at the end of the day, I want to win the event. So if I have to lay down just a little bit in skills to get through the event and win the event freestyle racing, I'll be ecstatic. Well, I think everybody here on our production staff knows how much you love the skills competition. Uh, <laughs> just a, you know, a little insight for you. I, every week we did a broadcast and we, we called it live in the booth. It was Colt's responsibility to call the play-by-play -play on skills. It was his favorite part of the entire event and just the enthusiasm that was there every week. Now I get to watch you do it. And every time I watch you do it, that's going to be in the back of my mind is how much you love the skills competition. So you're up, my friend. It's your it's your turn now. You got to you got to buddy your bread. I can't wait to hear how much you rip on me, man. I already know it's coming. <laughs> I think you might be putting more pressure on me than anybody else. Cause I'm like, man, what's Scott going to say about that now? You know, because I know I'm going to get a horror from you now after being well, in a booth with you for two years. We'll give you an IFB earpiece so you can hear the live commentary as it happens. All right. <laughs> uh, let's talk about there obstacles. Go. There you go. Let's talk about some obstacles that you, you may have faced um, going back to London. Was there anything that came up? Um, I know that, you know, there, there's been some some travel issues that they've kind of lightened up a little bit, but we're still in the, you know, coming out of a pandemic. So it's not easy right now. So what kind of obstacles do you have to deal with? We had the, the COVID obstacles, obviously, between with the building, just making sure that we're at, at, adhering to all the COVID protocols that the building has, the local government had there, and then getting back into the U.S. When we were planning that event, testing was still a requirement for all staff to get back into the U.S., which obviously is an inherent risk when you're testing 70-something people before they return to the U.S. Luckily, that requirement was dropped just before we traveled, so we didn't have to go through that, but it was something we had in place. We had a whole system to do video COVID tests at the stadium before we left. So just little things like that were probably the toughest. Uh, once we were on the ground, though, it was very much business as usual for us. Um, luckily, the U.K. was pretty relaxed on the COVID requirements, and so it was really Really just knocking the rust off of working out of containers, working with different supply sets, things we don't do in the States as much. Um, that was one of the biggest obstacles is just getting the staff back in that international mindset. From a company standpoint, I know, you know, Feld Entertainment and Feld Motorsports has a lot of properties 
out and everybody's starting to pick back up the touring operations. So I know when coming out of the pandemic, uh, you know, last October, when we did Arlington, we were the first live event to come back with an audience. Is it the same for Monster Jam in London, where we the first property in the company to go back internationally? So Disney on Ice actually beat us a little bit. They had a UK tour going before us. Um, but as far as the motorsports side go, yeah, that was the first uh, international event back. And we were the first non-soccer event back in that stadium. Uh, so it was a little bit of a change of pace for them as well. Uh, they actually followed us up with some concerts right after us. But we kind of opened that door to the other event side of things other than their their soccer because that's the home of West Ham. Well, let's talk about the the, the stadiums and, and they call them pitches over there. No, when we when we go and drive these 12,000 pound trucks on, a, on an NFL stadium, uh, obviously a lot of care is taken because you don't want to damage the grass when you do it. I know Miami is one that's that's a little little tight lipped about their field. I've made the mistake of putting a, a toe on it once and got you know yelled at from all directions. But um, these soccer fields, these soccer pitches are sacred ground over there. So I know that there has to be a high protocol to protect that. So how do you go about making sure that that, you know, sacrilege field that that you're you're driving under goes untouched well thankfully we have one of the best dirt teams in the world um that take care of not only not only the nfl stadiums here but all the major soccer pitches as well and mike chismar he's our director of international track instruction he is an expert in covering these fields we can move in on a thursday evening have a show on a saturday and then move out and the pitch will still be in good condition like you put sun back on it it comes right back and it's perfect um, so we've really perfected that over years. It's taken years to, to practice that, that method and to perfect it with what the groundskeepers need to do as far as sure. when to water, when to aerate the grass. They need to brush it as we uncover it just to stand it back up. There, there's a number of steps in there to ensure we save the pitch, but we've gotten it down to a science and it's worked great. We've done it in Australia now since 2013 um, with success every single year. Cole, do you have ever, when you're driving, you ever take into consideration what you're driving under? Obviously, it's just dirt, but, you know, and any, as a driver, you don't want to, obviously, you don't want to damage the, the grass or the pitch. So, does that cross your mind at all when you're in the truck? Absolutely. I mean, it won't change my driving style, but it'll change the decisions that I make if I'm close to the edge or something like that. Donuts, anything that I can go through the material into that grass. I know soccer is a huge deal, and I really do not want to make any of those fans up there mad because I tore their grass. So I'm always watching that. But talk about that. Those soccer stadiums are so big. At least they seem that big. I think make them on size. But in my mind, whenever I'm out there, I have so much room to stretch my legs. And that's what makes those events so great as well because I feel like I can go so much faster, so much bigger, and I don't have the walls so close. So that is what is really cool about those events. And a uh, testament to what Moser said is that those dirt crew guys and girls, they absolutely kill it when it comes to getting that grass done and making sure it's safe and all that stuff is great. So uh, I hats off to them. The work that they do, I've watched them bring that dirt stuff in, and it is absolutely unbelievable what they're able to do. Now, you mentioned the, the bigger stadiums over there. Do you think that gives you, uh, you know, a little more of a learning curve now coming back into the truck after almost three years that you have a bigger field, a bigger track to take advantage of? Absolutely. You know, getting in these trucks, we talk about it all the time. We're locked into these seats. It's, this really is a little bit hard. And it's going to take me a, a little bit to get used to it. You almost have to think of that truck being an extension of your body, learning where the rear is. How close can I get to something without actually touching? Is this the mark I can turn at? So having that little extra space, that little extra breathing room is going to make things a lot easier for me. I'm going to make Mosier a little nervous getting a little closer to the end, but... I know where I'm at. I'm gonna. I'm, I got a little extra room. He's not so quick to hit that RI and shut me off. So I got a little bit more playroom there, and it's great for me. It allows me to kind of, you know, let her all hang out and have a good time. Well, let's talk about, uh, we've talked about the past and the present, let's talk about the future. I know we have some international events on the calendar for the remainder of this year. So where is Monster Jam going? Well, as you mentioned, Australia, Melbourne, and Sydney's next up. Uh, we go straight from there to Finland. Brand new Nokia Arena, beautiful arena in Finland. Um, and Cole will be there, and Max D as well. Uh, and from there, we go to San Juan, Puerto Rico. 
we do uh, Arnhem Netherlands as our last show of the year, and that's in the beginning of December. So a busy next couple months coming up for us. And what about 2023? I know I mentioned the the busy year you had in 2019. Is there plans to get back to that in 2023? Yeah, it's going to take a while to just build back up to that. Just as we try to get dates and buildings and the booking process, we have a whole team of professionals that do nothing but try to book us events. So we work a little bit further out on 24, 25, 26 even oh, right wow. now. But 23 is looking busy. I mean, over top of five tours running in the U.S., we'll have Stockholm, Sweden in February. We'll have three shows in South Africa returning there to what should be three sold out events in South Africa, Durban, Cape Town and Johannesburg in April and May as well, all leading up to Dresden, Germany, which happens to be on the same day as Monster Jam World Finals in Nashville. Wow. So a dub- double dose there. Um, now, Colt, where, where can we see you internationally at the end of this year? Well, I will be in both uh, Australia events, Melbourne and Sydney. Finland and Holland, so I'm pumped to do all four of those events, get some seat time in. And who knows what's going to happen in 23? Maybe I'll get to go out and have a Mosier and go see the rest of the world. Or maybe I'll be uh, here in the States. So I'm excited. But something big's coming in 23, so everybody stay tuned. I'm excited. Well, listen, I'm gonna, as, as your friend, I want to give you a heads up. So Helsinki, Finland is the coldest place I've ever been in my life. So in the wintertime in Helsinki, I had to wear a ski mask. I took it off. felt like my face was burning off from the ice. I'm going to give you that advice. Do whatever you want with it. Wear a, wear a mask, wear something, because you don't want to get the icicles in your beard, my friend. I know how much you take <laughs> care with the, with the Cremo and the Just for Men that I taught you. Oh, uh, come on we don't, now. <laughs> yeah, I, I turned it down a little bit, trying to get clean cut like you, buddy. I like it, man. It looks good. Let's take some fan. No, man, you're going to be fine. Let's take some fan questions here. Uh, Blake Carr on Facebook uh, for you, Moser, wants to know, would it be feasible for International to evolve into a full-fledged points-paying tour in the near future with a World Finals berth on the line? And and, uh, we were headed there at one point, correct? Yeah, it's funny you mention that because we were. In 2020, that was the plan. Uh, With so many international events in 19 and 20, we were going to go down that road with points and get somebody into the World Finals based off of international events. And we're going to build back to that. It's just going to take time. uh, just to get back up to that number of events to make that a, a venture we can we can go down. And if it was a World Finals berth, it would be exclusive to a driver that's on the international tour, correct? Yeah, it wouldn't be, be somebody targeted. that's going back and forth, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, it'd be targeted to someone who's on international. All right. Uh, Monster Talk official on Instagram, Colt, wants to know what is it like, uh, what do you think it's going to be like going from commentary to back behind the wheel? I think it's going to take me a little bit to get used to the hits. You know, going back to the stadium, and we're going straight to the stadium, and we're going big out of the out of the game. So, you know, it's going to be a little bit of getting used to getting the truck out of there, uh, where the shocks are landing right. So a little bit, I'm probably going to be you know, losing my breath when I land, you know, because I don't like the big air. That's where we're going with it. I got a good crew guy over there, so I'm excited about that. You know, it's a funny story is when I when I first started and I drove in Melbourne. I remember my first time out there, the truck was absolutely beating me. My face was coming in. I was red. It's not coming out of my nose. And I thought it was great, but I didn't know any better. So this time I'm going to Melbourne. I'm excited. I'm going to have the truck dialed in. We're be ready to go. So get that first seat out of the way and let her eat, buddy. Um, Moser, what made you pick London for the first international stop after the pandemic? And this comes from Monster Jam King on 20, uh, Monster Jam King 29 on Instagram. It was like I said, we started planning that for 2020. So it was a natural place to pick back up because it was one of the first shows we didn't get to uh, when COVID happened. So kind of picked up right where we left off and trying to use that as a great launch pad for the rest of these international events. I mean, what city is bigger than London? Right. Was there any pushback from uh, anybody in the company that maybe it's, it's still too soon to go or was everybody just on board? It's time. Let's get it done. No, we were ready to go. It was a total team effort top to bottom and it was great to, to get back out on the road. Well, Monster Jam King 29 has a question for you, Colt. What's the difference from a driver's perspective between driving a diesel-powered Monster Jam truck and a regular methanol-powered Monster Jam truck? And uh, to combat that, will we ever see the return of you in Brodozer? You know, first, I'll answer the second question first. I you know, honestly don't know what the diesel brothers are doing with their uh, Brodozer truck. I haven't talked to him. I think they're pretty busy with his his stuff but uh, as far as driving the two different styles of trucks it's a nine day difference if i could uh, describe it that way you know we got a turbo on the diesel so i have what they call turbo lag i can hold the throttle wide open and it takes about two to three seconds to actually get the power to the ground so think about that i'm out there on the track i go to hit something i add two seconds to it 
That's a lot for Monster Jam time. Your alcohol is instantaneous. It's got a supercharger. But as soon as you hit that throttle pedal, you've got all 1,500 horsepower right at your foot going straight to the ground. So that's a big difference between the two. But it made me a better driver, I believe. I've learned how to get the truck more uh, where I want it to be in ahead. That's a big thing in Monster Jam, making sure that I know where I need to be, hitting my marks, and make sure I'm on time. If I get that, Timing correct in an alcohol truck, I think it's going to lead to great things because the snappability of an alcohol truck is great. It makes saves a lot better. That was what was super hard in the bulldozer because you get over on the sidewall and you pick that throttle two, three seconds, and you're on the roof. Alcohol, I can pick that throttle and I got instant power. We're coming back to the floor, we're going to get it. All right, well, final question as we wrap it up. This comes from Jeremy Bunting134 on Instagram. It's for Colt. Do you want a rematch in the RC race with Scott after the shenanigans that happened in Orlando? Now, hang on, Jeremy. I want to intercede here, okay? The shenanigans in Orlando was based on the fact that I just had gotten the truck like two days prior, and I'm not going to take on a professional driver in an RC race and humiliate myself. So I figured if I'm already going to be humiliated, I might as well do it in style. So I showed up like a clown for entertainment purposes, and I got the scars to prove it. My knuckles have still not recovered from the spill I took trying to sprint with that truck. But I am good now. I've had the truck for a while. I'm good, and I will take that rematch in Nashville. What say you, Colt? Yeah, you did a lot of acting throughout that whole event, but that fall, that was no acting. That was real. That was awesome. That was really I laughed awesome. for a while on that one. But you know what? I've been ha- I was hanging out with Barry all year. We were playing RC, so there's no way you're gonna win. So I totally understand why you're doing your little charades, running around the track and stuff. But if you ever touch my truck again, man, we're gonna have some problems. So <laughs> don't touch it. And uh, if you run stairs next year in uh, Syracuse, I'll tell you what, I'll rematch you. I don't need to run any stairs. I've done that. I pulled both my quads. They're still sitting back at the uh, carrier dome, whatever they call it now. And yes, the shenanigans were all pretend, but the blood I left on the track that day, that was real. So, uh, Liz, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Moser, for coming down. Congratulations again, man. It's good hanging out with you. Great to be here. I have one question, too, for you, Colt. One last fan question here. What are you going to miss more, being in the booth with this guy or the text messages you get from me when you're in the booth with this guy? (laughs) Well, unfortunately for you, now all the messing around with Scott I'm doing, you're going to catch. So we're going to have some fun. I will miss Scott a lot. But you know what, Mosier? I got to put that energy from your buddy. I hope you got your text messages ready because it's coming. All right, Cole, Steve, it's good to see you, my friend, man. Looking forward to some big things for the rest of this year and next year as well. Cowabunga, buddy. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. That's all the time we have for today. Join me next time as we take a look inside the Monster Jam garage with two of the best in the business, Dustin Brown and Jeff Sin. will be in studio right here next time on Inside Monster Jam.